St. Paul wrote, love is patient, love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Let us pray. Gracious God, be with us on our Holy Week pilgrimage. Open our eyes to the wonder of your love for men and women. A love so great that it led Jesus to embrace a cross. You long to see that love reflected in our lives. We know how frequently we fail and we ache to move beyond our weakness to the freedom your love offers us. As we visit Bethany and meet Mary, Martha and Lazarus again, may their love for the Lord and his for them be medicine for our souls and open to us new vistas of possibility. Amen. Psalm 36, verses 5 to 11. Your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens, and your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness stands like the strong mountains, your justice like the great deep. You, Lord, shall save both man and beast. How precious is your loving mercy, O God, all mortal flesh shall take refuge under the shadow of your wings. They shall be satisfied with the abundance of your house. They shall drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the well of life, and in your light shall we see light. O oh, continue your loving kindness to those who know you, and your righteousness to those who are true of heart. Let not the foot of pride come against me, nor the hand of the ungodly thrust me away. John chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he ha had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. John's gospel is our lectionary given guide to Jesus' last days this Holy Week. The Gospels share the same overall pattern of events, arrest, trial, crucifixion, death, burial. But John has a different perspective to the other three. Most scholars accept that John knew their work or the sources on which they are based, and that he was writing probably at least a decade later than them. And it's that distance which lends a perspective of deep thought, prayer, and meditation to his writing. 
The Passion of Jesus was a desperate story of human betrayal, brutality, and political chicanery. An innocent man tortured to death. Yet it was so much more. And John's perspective is about that more. Of all the evangelists, it's John who understands the life of Jesus through the lens of the resurrection and the church's liturgical reflection on the life and death of Jesus. He is more poet and theologian than chronicler. His gospel, an exploration of the wonder of the word made flesh and the accomplishment of the reconciliation of all to God in Christ. That is John's perspective and it alters the ways in which he tells the story of the passion. For example, If in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus remains resolutely silent before Pilate, in John, he engages him in a philosophical discussion about the nature of truth. If the earlier accounts understand Jesus to be the victim of political conniving and Roman imperial violence, in John, he is the paschal lamb sacrificed so that death might pass over the people. If in the synoptic accounts, Jesus cries, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In John, he says, it is finished. And the Greek word also means accomplished or completed and gives up his spirit. John's gospel falls roughly into two parts. The first part reveals who Jesus is through a series of signs beginning with the turning of water into wine at the wedding at Cana and ending with the raising of Lazarus. Jesus is the one who brings laughter, joy, salvation, life itself. And the second half, sometimes popularly called the Book of Glory, recounts his journey to Jerusalem, the cross and the empty tomb. And the turning point between the two is today's gospel, the anointing at Bethany. A banquet is being held in Jesus' honor. We're not told where, but we can assume that this was a communal celebration rather than a cozy family dinner party. Lazarus, silent as ever, is there. Martha, characteristically, serves. There is in John none of the tension between Mary and Martha that we find in Luke. Rather, the Bethany family are model non-itinerant disciples, perhaps belonging to the same community as Nicodemus and the beloved disciple whose memories were treasured in the Gospel of John. The account of the raising of Lazarus has left us in no doubt of the sisters' love and devotion to Jesus. But now Mary makes that love manifest. She takes a pound of costly, pure nard, pours it over Jesus' feet, and wipes them with her hair. It is an act of remarkable extravagance touched with a gentle, almost reverent eroticism and sensuality as the beautiful scent fills the house. Mark and Matthew both tell how an unnamed woman anointed Jesus' head with precious ointment at the house of Simon the leper in Bethany. Unnamed, perhaps, because this was a subversive act For Jewish kings were anointed, and therefore a dangerous act with serious political repercussions, even at the time Mark was writing. And perhaps for the same reason, he doesn't name the servant who cuts off Malchus's ear at the arrest. John, writing much later, has no such compunction. It was Peter who cut off Malchus's ear, and Mary is the woman who anoints Jesus. 
But John seems to correct the account, not his head, but his feet. Not so much the consecration of a king, but the ritual enactment of his burial. It is almost unbearably poignant. Mary's love overflows, unbuttoned. She reads the signs of the times. This is the beginning of a journey to death. This tender, beautiful, wonderful man, this sublime dinner guest, will be brutally put to death. And so the fragrance rises in symbolic contrast to the stench of Lazarus's body when he stumbled out of the tomb. It is a moment of sheer beauty and sheer love. And yet John, the narrator, tinges it not just with outraged real politic. Could the perfume not have been sold and given to the poor? But betrayal, for it is Judas in John who voices the objection, not the disciples as a group. The disciples don't yet know about the betrayal, but we who share John's perspective inevitably do. At the beginning of the Passion, then, we encounter an act of passionate devotion and sensory beauty. When Archbishop William Temple reflected on this passage in 1939 and 1940 in his spiritual classic readings in St. John's Gospel, he rooted Mary's love in gratitude and thanksgiving for the gift of Lazarus raised from the tomb, for the gift of life itself, for the redemption with which Jesus had touched her life. And he wrote, it's more important to thank God for blessings received than to pray for them beforehand. If we pray for something, there is always an element of self-interest in our prayer. But he said, the backward looking act of thanksgiving is quite free from this. All our love for God is in response to his love for us. In Mark's gospel, Jesus responds to the disciples' criticism of the woman we now know to be Mary with the words, she has performed a good service for me. And the word good in Greek also means beautiful. A beautiful work. As the scent rises through the house in John's account, we are left with a picture of the price Jesus will pay for his love of God's world. The ultimate price. And a picture of the devotion that such love creates. A beautiful work. As we leave Bethany and travel on, we are left with a question. What beautiful work might the wonder of Holy Week evoke from us? Will the fragrance of our love fill the house as Mary's did that night at Bethany?
Let us pray. Our prayers for others. Gracious God, whose costly love led to arrest, torture, and death, you invite us to see in Jesus how life might be lived for others. Hear our prayers for those who, like Mary of Bethany, are called to acts of selfless devotion and subversion. We pray for those called to stand against tyranny, for those whose courage has led them to become prisoners of conscience, for those who champion the earth against all who would pollute and exploit the planet, and for those who fight continually that the riches of the world might be fairly shared and poverty and hunger be turned into history. May they know your strength, your resilience, and your hope. Just as Mary realized that Jesus was worthy of all beauty and excellence, so we pray that we too might journey to Jerusalem ready to pour our all at our Lord's feet and be counted amongst those who anoint him king and serve him with joy. Amen. And now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen.